The other day I was playing Among Us when four other friends, when one of them viciously killed my character. Unfortunately, I do not know who killed me. It could have been any one of the other four suspects. Luckily, there was a sample of sweat next to my dead body and criminologists managed to find DNA samples of each of the other four suspects. They decided that DNA fingerprinting would be the best way to match the sample to the killer. Each DNA sample was amplified, including my own, into a gel electrophoresis machine to create a DNA fingerprint for a specific locus of variable number tandem repeats. Essentially, a match to the sample found next to my body would be that of the killers. Each DNA is different and has its own unique genetic makeup. Therefore, the DNA samples that separate and travel the same distance shows they are from the same DNA. One locus is not enough to determine a relationship between the sample and the suspect, so another amplification is run for a second locus of a different VNTR. In order to find out who the potential killer is, their DNA fingerprint must match exactly with that of the sample. In the first locus, the sample DNA traveled across the gel here and here. So in order to find the match, we need to find which other samples separated exactly the same as this one. The victim sample did not separate like the sample DNA, so we can automatically rule out the victim. Again, the DNA must have separated exactly like the sample DNA in order for us to assume it is a match. Suspect 1 has DNA separation here and here, which corresponds to the sample DNA. However, we cannot assume this is a match until we view the second DNA fingerprint for the second locus. Suspect 2 has only one match, and therefore cannot be the killer. Suspect 3 does not match at all with the sample, so it is also not the killer. Suspect 4 also has the same exact separation as the sample, but as we did for suspect 1, we will not assume it to be the killer until we analyze the second locus. So we have eliminated the victim, suspect 2, and suspect 3 from our list, once again because they did not match the sample DNA. But since we had two suspects match, we will need to cross-reference with a separate locus to see who exactly the killer might be. The second locus has different separation for the sample DNA here and here. We can skip the victim because we already ruled him out, so we can look at suspect 1. We can see that suspect 1 does not match the sample DNA, so we can assume that suspect 1, although matching the sample in the first locus, does not match the second locus. Therefore, he was not the killer. Suspect 2 was eliminated already. Suspect 3, although having the same separation as his locus, did not match the alleles of the previous locus, therefore the source DNA is not the same. That leaves suspect 4, who has the same separation as the sample. Since suspect 4 has matching DNA fingerprints to the sample DNA in both loci, we can assume that suspect 4 left DNA at the crime scene and is most likely the killer. Another interesting point we can extrapolate is a paternal relationship between two suspects. In order to assume a paternal relationship between two DNA fingerprints, one must look for consistently same separation of alleles for one of the DNA fragments in all the loci. To put it more simply, if there is one match of alleles across both loci, we can assume one is a parent of another. We can see that suspect 2 and 1 share a common brand here. No other suspects, including the victim, share the similarity among one another. Therefore, we can assume that suspect 1 is the son or parent of suspect 2.